Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. This is the Earth. Our atmosphere is a thin layer of gas that keeps us safe from harmful solar radiation, keeps us warm at night with its insulating properties, and transports heat and moisture around the planet. In this visualization, using data from the GFDL Earth System model, the atmosphere has been exploded to approximately 30 times its actual height. Doing so, we can see the structure of the atmosphere much more clearly. We can see the jet streams in each hemisphere, narrow bands of fast moving air in the mid latitudes. Higher up, we can see the stratospheric polar vortex spinning over the wintertime pole in the upper atmosphere. We can also see that the Earth is wreathed in clouds. At any one time, about 67% of the Earth's surface is obscured by clouds, and these have a huge effect on the Earth's climate. They cool the Earth by reflecting sunlight away from its surface, stopping solar energy from warming the land or ocean underneath. Clouds are obviously formed by water evaporating from the oceans into the atmosphere, and the warmer the oceans are, the more evaporation takes place. Therefore, you would expect that if the Earth were to warm, more clouds would form, and these clouds would then act to cool the Earth, acting as a moderating influence, pushing it back to its original, cooler temperature. Let's test this. Dialing in some global warming, we start to see more clouds. So far, so good. But something unusual is happening. The cloud coverage of the Earth has increased, but the planet is continuing to warm. What's going on? Aren't the clouds reflecting more solar energy away from the Earth? Shouldn't the Earth be cooling instead? Well, by warming the Earth, we've increased the rate of evaporation from the oceans. This results in more clouds, but it also results in an invisible change in the atmosphere. As well as more clouds, it now contains more water vapour. To explain what the difference is between those two things, here's fellow atmospheric physicist and Oxford grad Dr Adam Levy, who you might already know from their excellent YouTube channel, Climate Adam. Water vapour is, well, it's kind of what it says it is, water in its vapour form. So the water that we drink is a liquid and water vapour is a gas. It floats around mixed in with all the other gases and all in all makes up a couple of percent of Earth's atmosphere. Though that depends whether we're talking about the atmosphere above an ocean or the atmosphere above a desert. Clouds, on the other hand, are not gaseous. They're actually liquid or solid. That might sound ridiculous since they're floating in the air, but a cloud is actually made up of loads of tiny water droplets, or in the case of an ice cloud, ice crystals. Because they're a different state of matter, they actually have very different climate properties than water vapour. One of the most important subjects in climate science is feedbacks, positive and negative feedbacks to be precise. Now, positive and negative feedback might sound like the description for any YouTube comment section, but that's not exactly what climate scientists mean by it. When we talk about feedbacks, we mean a positive feedback is something that amplifies any global temperature changes that are going on, and a negative feedback is something that dampens those changes. Water vapour acts as a positive feedback, boosting global warming. That's because water in its gaseous form is actually a greenhouse gas. It may be invisible to the naked eye, but it absorbs the infrared radiation that the Earth gives off. So if something heats the planet up, that increases the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere, and that heats things up even more. A positive feedback. A crucial question is how all the different feedbacks interact and what the total effect will be. In other words, what the total global warming will be. One way to get at an answer is to use climate models like the one Simon's been showing you. Of course, all models, including the one Simon's been showing you, are imperfect. In other words, they have biases. So climate scientists use lots of different models, all of which simulate the climate in slightly different ways and so have slightly different biases. The hope is that by taking the average across all these models, you get a more trustworthy answer for how big the feedbacks will be, and so how hot the world will get. Any increase in the temperature of the Earth is accompanied by various feedbacks, some positive, some negative. The climate model that generated this data accounts for many of these feedbacks, but can't account for all of them. The system's just too complicated. The largest feedbacks, such as the increase in the Earth's reflectivity due to an increase in clouds, 
is accounted for, as is the increased insulation provided by a higher percentage of water vapour in the atmosphere. The fact is though that any model is just a representation of reality. In statistical modelling there's a saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This model is useful to us, and that can be verified by comparing it to real climate observations. It's not perfect, sure, but it does a pretty good job of representing reality. With that said, there's one more thing to still explain. How exactly did we produce the warming in this model? This model was warmed as part of a standard experiment performed to test different climate models, quadrupling the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This increase in CO2 produced warming all on its own, as the gas efficiently stops heat from leaving the Earth, causing it to build up in the atmosphere and thus the average temperature to increase. This is exactly what we humans are doing by emitting so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. However, as we saw, after this initial warming had taken place, the temperature of the planet continued to rise despite its increased cloud cover. This was because of the positive feedback from water vapour overwhelming the other feedbacks. This means that water vapour amplifies any warming in the system that we humans produce by emitting greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide. It does this so much that in fact water vapour is the most significant greenhouse gas of all, responsible for around 50% of all anthropogenic global warming. CO2 by comparison only contributes around 20%. We know that water vapour is boosting the global warming that we're causing, but it seems that cloud cover is more complex than first meets the eye, potentially also acting as a positive feedback. In a collab over on my channel, we discuss why water in both vapour and clouds is crucial to understanding climate change, but why carbon dioxide is still the culprit and the thing we need to cut. Simon helped me out and I even got him to sing, although it didn't take much convincing. This planet is beautiful in its complexity. That complexity is visible in the pattern of winds across its surface and in its response to changes in the atmosphere. The net result of that complexity is somewhat uncertain, but it certainly seems that the net influence of water in vapour and in clouds is to amplify what we humans do. The visualisation in this video was made by me from scratch, and doing so required several key skills. Firstly, knowing how to navigate the data structures climate scientists use. Secondly, writing a Python script to pull the data from those structures and put it into Blender. And lastly, a surprising amount of trigonometry to make the clouds work. If you'd like to make something similar, then you can improve all of these skills with Brilliant, an educational website and app that focuses on learning by doing. It's simple, you just pick one of their expertly written, wonderfully illustrated interactive courses that interests you, and you get stuck in. Try solving some problems, and if you get them wrong, that's okay. Brilliant is all about learning from your mistakes and making sure that you know it's okay to make them. They have courses on every aspect of the workflow of this video, from abstract computer science to programming with Python to trigonometry, quite apart from their courses on the radiative physics discussed in this video. Brilliant is perfect to supplement your learning in the classroom if you're a student, or expanding your skills if you're out in the big wide world of employment. To get a sweet 20% discount on an annual subscription, go to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, but be quick, only the first 200 people to click the link in the description will get this great deal. Invest in yourself and get learning brilliantly. Thanks to Brilliant for their continued support of this channel. Thank you so much to Adam for taking part in this video. If you haven't checked out their YouTube channel before, definitely do. They make really good videos about all aspects of climate science, including up-to-date research, as well as myths and misconceptions that are commonly propagated on the internet. This visualization took quite some time to develop, and I really hope you're going to be seeing more of it in the future. If you'd like to see more videos like this, then definitely hit the subscribe button. And if you enjoyed this video, please do pop it a like. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.